All right, I'll just note that uh, we're outside the presence of the jury and uh, Mr. Carlin has been sworn. There were some concerns raised by the state. Uh, the court had a sidebar with Ms. Nodal and uh, Ms. Vishni. Uh, and I'm not going to get into detail. Again, I'm just uh, cite section 906.11, subsection 1C. Uh, in any event, uh, I just have to advise you, Mr. Carlin, that this, uh, this is a public trial. I don't have authority to close this hearing or to uh, you know, hide your identity. Um, however, uh, there is certain personal information. Uh, I think uh, what Council asks you what you know who your employer is, um, the actual employer, and what you do, but not where your actual location where you work, and neither party is going to go into that specifically. I understand. We're also uh, there's no need uh, at this point to put your actual address on the record, and. Uh, and we're not, I don't believe anyone's going to be asking you what your phone number is. There also were some pretrial rulings that the court had made, uh, and there are certain opinions uh, that you are not allowed to give. And uh, I don't know whether the state has spoken with you about that. Um, had, in witness prep, have you had an opportunity to do that? Mr. No, we did not have witness prep at all with Mr. Carlin. Okay, and who is responsible? Who is going to be conducting the examination? I am, Your Honor. Okay. So, um, you may testify to observations that you make, um, but in particular with uh, respect to certain opinions that you may have, may have shared with law enforcement with respect to Ms. McCandless, um, you're, the court has ordered that you're not to give those opinions. Um, you can again share your observations, and I believe the state will be careful about asking you about those things um, and uh, I'm not entirely sure of why you are called as a witness I have some idea but again I, I do not believe you are called to give opinions about uh, Ms. McCandless. Is that a fair statement? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now there also is a motion in limine um, was uh, the state had offered certain evidence with as other acts evidence um, as to show intent in this particular case, which the court, uh, I don't remember if it was granting the defense motion to exclude that or denying the state's motion to be able to use that other act's evidence. This is with respect to the driving. Now, it may come out that Ms. McCandless was not to drive and that she hid the keys, but you are not to say the, you know, the specific reason for that. Understood? And you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I understand, sir. Just about status. So, um, is there anything else that the state would like to talk uh, to Mr. Carlin about before we bring in the jury? No, Your Honor. I believe defense is okay with me leading Mr. Carlin a little bit, and so I, I may do that in my All right. And it, again, I think when it's necessary to develop the testimony and make sure we avoid certain things. Now, I also was brought to my attention that you happen to see some of the TV coverage in this case. Now, frankly, the exclusion order, the primary purpose of that is to ensure that witnesses do not see the testimony of other witnesses to the same events or facts that you may testify to. Um, I don't know what you saw, um, and again, I, I'm not sure whether you know, I have an idea what you may be called to testify about, but I'm not exactly sure whether you have seen a testimony of uh, any other witnesses that may involve testimony that you would be asked to give today. Um, I have not. Okay. So, anything further, uh, Ms. Nodal? No. Okay. And you understand from this, but, well, after you're done testifying, if you're excused, then you would be free to watch coverage after that point, but you could not come back as a witness. Yes, sir. Understood? Yes, sir. Would you be free to sit in the courtroom, Your Honor? 
He would be free to sit in the courtroom if he wishes, as long as nobody's going to recall him as a witness. There's a, certainly a good potential he may be recalled as a rebuttal witness. Okay. Well, then, in that event, as long as it's you know, possibly, you know, then, you know, I don't know that you should be watching coverage if you may be recalled as a witness. And again, understand it's a very difficult situation uh, that you are in, uh, but it is uh, it's difficult for many people involved in this case. So, um, anything further either counsel would like to say before we bring the jury back in? Okay, then Mr. Carlin, if you would please just step down, if you can stand in the gallery, we'll call you as a witness, uh, just like you have a bet on the witness stand already, okay? All right, so, bring the jury in. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Joe Shane Carlin, J-O-S-H-A-N-E-K-A-R-L-E-N. And Mr. Carlin, uh, do you work as a side job with a tree cutting business? Yes, ma'am. And what do you do for that job? Owner operator. And what can you explain? For tree removal, tree? tree service. Tree removal. Um, and do you know uh, the defendant, Ezra McCandless? I do. How do you know her? She's my daughter. And uh, did you adopt her at some point? Yes, ma'am. And how old uh, was the defendant when you adopted her? Around four and a half to five. And were you married to the defendant's mother? Yes. And how long were you married to her? Six or seven years. Okay. And do you know how old the defendant was uh, when you and her mom got divorced? Around 12. And what was um, the defendant's name when she was growing up? Monica J. And was her last name Carlin? Yes. And um, has the defendant ever helped you with that tree cutting business? Several times, yes. And what would be her job when she helped you? Uh, dragging brush, cleaning up, raking. And uh, where do you live, sir? Stanley. And approximately one week before uh, the death of the victim in this case, do you recall the defendant showing up at your house in Stanley asking for a place to stay? Yes. Uh, do you recall what the defendant said to you? She just asked if she could stay there for a while with me while she had to get some things figured out. And how did you respond? Of course. And after that night, when was the next time that you saw her? I believe I've seen her several times in the next few days. Do you recall her being gone for a couple of days after she said she was going to crash at your house? She left a couple times, but she came back. And when she left for a couple days, did you know where she was Where she Objection. was at? Objection mischaracterizes the evidence. He didn't say she left for a couple of days. Sustained. <coughs> Mr. Carlin, if you, um, do you recall speaking to some officers uh, on March 24th of 2018 at your, in Stanley? I believe so if that was when they all came to meet with us yes and if you re uh, if you reviewed a transcript of that recording um, would that refresh your recollection of potentially what you said that day objection he didn't say his memory needed to be refreshed sustained okay, so let me ask you did was the fen was the defendant gone overnight when she first came to your house she asked if she could if she could stay there, and then was she gone overnight for a period of time? I believe one of the nights she was gone overnight, yes. And did you know where she was? I did not. Did she leave you a note indicating where she was going to be? No, she's an adult. Um, shortly before the incident in this case... 
Uh, do you recall contacting uh, a Jason Mingle over text message? I spoke with him periodically, yes. And do you recall sending him a message regarding a change? Objection, hearsay, irrelevant. His text messages to a third person are not relevant to this trial. Well, I, I don't know that without knowing what they are, Mr. Nelson. Um, and the fact that I'm going to overrule as far as him sending the messages, but as far as content of any messages he received from somebody else, that would be hearsay, unless there's some exception that applies. Do you remember um, observing a change in demeanor in the defendant when she was staying with you? Yeah, I felt as if she was in improving on the way she was feeling and we were going in the right direction. Do you recall indicating that she seemed very different and strange? Objection. Can we approach? Sidebar. Objection sustained, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Thank you. Microphone not on. Okay, go ahead. Sustain. Um, sir, on March 23rd of 2018, do you recall visiting with the defendant at the hospital? I do. And did you try to talk to the defendant to determine what was going on? Of course. And did you ask the defendant why she decided to drive? Yes. And prior to that date, did you hide the defendant's keys in your house? Yes, I set them on top of a shelf. And do you know where her car was at the time? It was right in front of my home. So you're at the, on March 22nd, the car was parked in front of your house? If you're asking when she took the car from my house, then yes, it was parked out in front of my house. And uh, you hid her keys because you didn't want her to drive? Correct. And did you, how did she respond when you asked her why she drove? She said she had some things she needed to take somewhere and, and deal with a couple of things. And you specifically told the defendant not to drive, is that right? Objection asked and answered. That specifically wasn't, you can answer that question. <laughs> so did you specifically tell the defendant not to drive? Yes, but she's an adult and she can drive. Um, and I'm sorry, you were stating, did she tell you why, what items she needed to return? No. Uh, did she tell you that she was going to see Alex? No. Sir, do you were Call when you spoke with officers um, on March 24th of 2018? I don't recall meeting with anyone. Do you recall yes, um, an investigator Stalker and investigator Dykus as well as investigator Kowalczyk speaking with you on March yes. 24th? Yeah. And um, if you reviewed a transcript of their recording from your conversation, would that refresh your memory? Same objection. He didn't say he didn't remember the conversation. He said he didn't recall meeting with anyone. I think that he can refresh his recollection. So overrule that objection. That may I approach, Your Honor? You may. <coughs> Do you recall telling the officers that uh, the defendant told you she had Alex's heating pad? She said she had a heating pad, but she never made mention of whose it was. And do you recall her saying that she just wanted to give it back to Alex? I recall her saying she needed to return it to someone. And do you recall her telling you that she just couldn't have, wouldn't have anything of his anymore? That she didn't want to have anything of Alex's anymore? She never said Alex at all. I never knew Alex. And do you recall the defendant um, telling you that she wanted to give him the heating pad so she could be free of having to deal with him at all? 
she stated that she needed to return some things to her friend so that she didn't have to go back there any longer. And uh, when you met with the defendant at the hospital on March 23rd of 2018, did she tell you that she was assaulted? No. Do you recall telling the officers that the defendant told you that she went to Owen Park? I don't recall. And do you recall the defendant telling you and that's where the assault happened? I don't recall that either, ma'am. Okay. It's all right, it's been a while. Um, and on March 22nd of 2018, did you ask the defendant to do something with respect to your other child? I really don't remember. It's been quite a while. Sure. Do you remember um, asking the defendant to make sure she was there to get your son off the bus from school? It's likely that could have happened. It, it was a pretty common thing when I worked late, yes. And do you recall the defendant um, deleted her Facebook account shortly before the date in question? Objection, no foundation, irrelevant. Just hold on, okay. okay. I'm going to sustain a lack of foundation. You can ask it a different way. some questions about the um, information uh, that you got from the defendant that you don't recall about Owen Park. If you reviewed a transcript, would that refresh your recollection? It, it very well may. Okay. And then um, if you reviewed the same transcript regarding the heating pad, would that possibly refresh your recollection? I'm sure. him the transcript that it starts with his name on page 27 line 1203 I'm directing him to page 28 of the transcript lines 1225 through 1226 as well as pages or lines 1244 to 1245 so if you reviewed those sentences you can let me know if that would refresh your recollection Seems pretty accurate. Objection. Move that that be stricken. <coughs> I think the question is whether that refreshes his memory. All right. The uh, portion of the witness indicated seems pretty accurate to be stricken. J jury will disregard that answer. And uh, Ms. Nodoff, I, you can ask him if that refreshes his recollection. And then what is his recollection? Mr. Carlin, um, after reading those lines on the transcript, does that refresh your recollection? Yes. And uh, do you recall what the defendant told you about why she returned or wanted to return Alex's heating pad? Yeah, she just stated she wanted to return it so that she didn't have to go back there or deal with it anymore. <laughs> and um, did she also tell you that uh, she was assaulted? No. Did she tell you that uh, an assault occurred at Owen Park? I don't believe that she told me anything about Owen Park from what I remember. 
Um, sir, when the defendant came to uh, stay with you, do you recall that she brought some belongings to your house? Yes. Um, do you recall what she brought? She brought her clothes. She brought uh, her laptop. And um, when you met with the officers on March 24th of 2018, did they execute a search warrant at your house? Yes. And uh, when they executed that search warrant, do you remember directing the officers uh, to the location in your living room where the defendant's belongings were? Yes. And did the officers ask you about any knives in the house? They asked me if there were any weapons in the home. And did they also ask you if there were any knives in the home? I believe that what they asked me was were there weapons. I don't specifically recall if it was directly related to knives. Do you recall uh, Investigator Kowalczyk asking you if any pocket knives, any kind of knives or anything that you know of? Yes. And how did you respond? Well, I have knives that I use for work that I have at home. And uh, what did you use those knives for? Well, they're EMT knives and I have them for cutting ropes when working. Uh, doing tree work and I also keep them in a vehicle with me and did you show the officers where the knives were located in your house where I knew I had one for sure I did and where did you take the officer uh, my I call it my junk drawer in my in my kitchen um, do you first recall taking the officer to uh, like a nightstand uh, in your living room area Do you recall the officers uh, locating uh, a knife in your house that day? The one in the kitchen that I showed them, yes. So, the officers didn't find a knife in your living room? Not from what I recall. I, they photographed the one from my kitchen in my living room. And did you direct the officers to a second knife that you believed was in your house? I did not find a second one at all in my house. And did you take the officers to a knife in your kitchen, or excuse me, did you take the officers to a basket in your kitchen where the second knife was supposed to be located? I looked in there because it was possible that it could be. And that was after they found the first EMT knife? Yes. Okay, and you couldn't find that second knife in the kitchen where you thought it would be, is that right? Right. And so then did you, uh, take the officers to your uh, work truck? Yeah. Um, and did, you, did they search in that work truck to try to locate the second EMT knife? I went through the whole truck, yes. And did you locate that second EMT knife? No, ma'am. And when the defendant was staying with you shortly before this incident in question, do you recall the defendant receiving phone calls at odd hours of the night? Uh, up to like 9 or 10 o'clock. I didn't consider them odd. Did you tell the officers that you woke up at for work at 5 a.m. and the defendant was still on a phone call? I recall that she was, yes. I don't know if I discussed that with your detectives. Let's go back to this EMT knife. Um, did you have, you had two of those, is that right? At least two. And uh, do you recall telling the officers that you had just purchased two EMT knives on Amazon for your work? Yeah. And while you found the one in the house, you were still missing the other, is that right? Right. Not uncommon. We lose tools and stuff all the time. And 
you said the defendant started to stay with you approximately one week before this incident in question. Is that right? Yes. And when was the last time you had seen her before that? Seen her periodically every couple weeks up until then. And on March 24th of 2018, you recall the officers, uh, do, did you see the officers seize one of those EMT knives from your house? Yes. And then when they left on March 24th of 2018, you were unable to locate the other knife, is that right? I didn't even look anymore. But you looked in, in the kitchen, is that right? And you looked in your work truck. Direction mm -hmm. asked and answered. Sustained. I have no further questions. All right, any uh, cross-examination? Yes, please. Uh, Go ahead. Mr. Carlin, this is your daughter here? Yes, sir. She came and stayed with you when she was 19 years old, right? Yes, sir. In the spring of 2018, correct? That's right. Um, she lived with you throughout her childhood, correct? Yes. Um, fair to say you, nothing unusual about your daughter coming and staying with you at some point during her... Uh, early adulthood, right? Nothing strange about it at all. Um, you um, talked about your telling her that you didn't want her to drive. You remember talking about that? Yeah. Um, you had your own reasons for doing that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, it didn't have to do with uh, her driving or uh, her ability to drive in any way, correct? Correct. It wasn't a safety matter for her or for anybody else. Agreed? Agreed. All right. Uh, this is just a father, as sometimes us fathers do, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, imposing our will sometimes on our children. I would agree. Okay. Um, You um, spoke with the police, it sounds like, after um, Ezra was found at the farmer's house, uh, muddy and bloody and hyperventilating, right? Yes. And when you spoke with the police, that was on a day that you had been off at a tournament, is that right? That is right. Um, you're... Uh, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, you uh, pretty straight laced for the most part? Very much so. Um, but every now and then, probably like, who amongst us doesn't? You, there's an event that uh, you might go and partake of some beverages, right? Yes. And on that day, the 24th, had you gone to like a, was it a softball tournament? It was a dart tournament. A dart tournament. And a dart tournament was where? In a bar? It was. When you were in that dart tournament in a bar, were you there all day? I got there at probably around 11 a.m. And you left there? Shortly before the deputies would have met with us. That's the only reason I left is because I was told I needed to come home. Okay. And again, not trying to <clears throat> characterize you, but during that time, you're in a bar drinking beer, right? Yes. Uh, probably had a lot of beer. Right? Several, yes. Um, and fair to say that's not typical for you. You don't normally consume alcohol, agreed? Maybe one or two beers a month. So you agree that that was an unusual day for you, for whatever reason, you were kind of letting your hair out and drinking some, right? I was. There was some stress that you would obviously been under, correct? Yes. Um, and so when you met with the officers on that day, Fair to say you were under the influence? Heavily. Of alcohol, correct? Yes. Um, uh, when you initially spoke with the police, um, you didn't know all of the circumstances of why your daughter was in the hospital, did you? Not a clue. And you were uh, angry at her, right? 
I was a little upset she drove and took the car, yes. She not followed what her father had asked her to do, correct? Correct. And that made you angry? I would agree with that, yes. And so when you first spoke with the police, it sounds like you were angry and drunk? Not something I'm proud of, but yes. Might have exaggerated some of your thoughts about your daughter at that point? I'm sure, yes. Okay. Um, again, not something, I'm not trying to get anything, not something, it sounds like you regret that, right? I do very much. Um, you, you were the, uh, the police executed a search warrant at your house, is that right? They did. And as you said, they asked you about weapons, is that right? Yes. You, uh, you're a gun owner? Yes. You have lots of guns in your house, correct? There are several, yes. Um, and I didn't mean to say lots, like, how many guns do you have in your house? In the proximity of a dozen. Okay. And um, did you tell the police about the guns that were in your house? I did. Um, were some of the guns in a safe? None of them are in a safe. Uh, where are the guns? There's a gun cabinet upstairs. Um, is the gun cabinet locked? The gun cabinet itself is not locked, but the guns do have locks. Okay. Are all of the guns in the gun cabinet with locks? No. Are there some other guns placed, for lack of a better term, strategically around the house or in vehicles? There are. Uh, like where? Uh, is this relevant, Mr. Nelson? Yes, it is. What is the relevance of this? Uh, I believe the state's portraying that she took a knife from the house when there's a boatload of guns in the house. And so I just want to portray that if she wanted to take a weapon, there was guns available. Oh, okay, I think you've made your point. I don't think we need to go any further on that. Can I just ask one follow-up question to sum that up? Yeah, but I don't think we need to broadcast for the world uh, the answers to those questions. Okay. I think you've I'm not trying to broadcast it for the world. I'm trying to establish facts for my okay. client. I think you've established that fact. So do your follow-up question and move on. There were guns that were accessible to Ezra McCandless in your house on March 22nd, 2018. Agreed? Readily Objection available. calls for speculation. Uh, overrule the objection. You may answer that question and then we're going to move on. Were the guns accessible to Ezra McCandless in your house on March 22nd, 2018? They're readily available, yes. Um, the tree, uh, they asked you also about knives, is that right? Yes. They're, um, Ezra, you said, had worked with you um, in the tree cutting service? Yes. And as part of that work, did you see her use a knife? Yeah. Um, is that part of the regular duties within your uh, employment when, or when she's employed by you? Well, if they're not good at tying knots that come out very easily, they unfortunately have to cut my ropes, yes. And sometimes they're using the knife on uh, trees or branches or twigs or other things, correct? As a tool or for cutting ropes, yes. Okay. Has, have you um, loaned, given uh, knives for those purposes to your daughter, Ms. McCandless? Yes. Um, have you uh, told her, uh, given her knives for other reasons? I had. So what other reasons had you given her a knife? I gave her a knife similar to this one to keep in her vehicle with her. As I told her, it had a seatbelt cutter on it. It also has a punch on the end for breaking a window in the event that you would need it in an accident you were in yourself, or if you came upon a car accident that you could be of help. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, have you talked to her about self-defense? Just basic father, daughter, you know, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel as if you need to protect yourself or others, just take care of yourself. The, I want to ask you some questions about 
uh, March 21st, 2018, okay? Sure. Ezra and you had a conversation that day, right? Yes, sir. That evening, correct? Right. I think as you'd said before, um, uh, her demeanor was improving, right? Yes. And when she came to you on that day, what did you see about her improvement in her demeanor on the 21st in that evening? Uh, she was positive and upbeat. She was looking forward to gaining new employment and getting a, a new start back home by us. And uh, we had talked about how we were going to you know, get back on track, helping her budget and get some money put away for obtaining a residence of her own. Um, without getting into the content, I don't want to get the content, but did she... <clears throat> she um, share some thoughts and feelings with you that night that she'd had about life and everything in general? Yes. Um, and did you, in turn, as her father, give her some fatherly advice back? I did. What did you say? I told her that you know, everything that's happened in the past, and no matter what you're going through, that that's fine, but you know, life starts tomorrow. You can leave all that behind. Wasn't the expression that you'd said was, life starts now? Is that what you'd said? Now or tomorrow, I Some, believe. Somewhere along those lines? Absolutely. And you'd meant that as, let's move forward, correct? Right. And that's what you passed on to your daughter on March 21st, correct? Yes, whatever we needed to do to get to where we needed to get. And that was in a positive mode that you had told her that, correct? Yes, sir. And that positivity was reciprocated back to you from Ms. McCandless in her demeanor and mood and appearance. Agreed? Very much, yes. She seemed to be accepting of that, correct? Yep. In some way relieved, perhaps. Your Honor, can we have a sidebar on that, please? That's my last question on it. All right, well then just let it sit. I don't think we need a sidebar. Somewhat relieved? Yes. That's all. Thank you. Can you redirect, Ms. Nodal? Yes. Mr. Carlin, did you tell the officers that you gave the defendant a knife? A knife? Yes. I don't recall if I ever told them that I gave her a knife. And do you recall, do you remember when the officers asked you if you had any knives in the house? You told them, I have a couple knives. Do you remember that? Yeah. And did you tell them they're not work knives, they're just flip ones that I'm doing for my tree service? Did you say that? It was a long time ago. I don't, I'm not going to remember every single thing I said with them. And did you tell them as far as any that she would have, no, referring to knives? I don't recall if I said that or not, ma'am. If you refer, re, reviewed the transcript from your conversation with the officers, would that refresh your recollection? It very well may. Showing you page 34 of a transcript, I'm directing you to lines 1515 15 through 1517. If you can review that to see if it refreshes your recollection. Does that refresh your recollection? It really doesn't. Okay. And, sir, would you recall that your 
recollection would have been better back on March 24th of 2018 than it is today? Well, I would think if it, the sooner it was to the incident, obviously I would be remembering it a lot easier, yes. And were you lying to the police that day? No. And did you tell them, I just have a couple knives in my home. They're not, they're just like work knives, you know, just flip open ones for when I'm doing my tree service, if I've got to cut a rope. As far as any that she would have, no. Did you say that? I remember telling them that I have knives. Okay, but just yes or no, did, do you remember stating I that? I don't remember saying it how you are. And you were asked on uh, cross about some self-defense conversation you had with the defendant. Do you remember that? I really don't. Do you remember uh, telling the defendant about um, when she was a kid in the lunchroom and if it, you know a kid were to pick on you, you knee him in the nuts? Do you remember saying that? That wasn't the words I would have used, no. Did you say, I told you the first thing you do is knee him in the nuts? I don't recall that statement at all. I have nothing else. Okay, any cross briefly to that redirect? Um, just about this night. Do you recall giving the knife that you talked about and described at some point in the past to Ezra McCandless? I do. That's all. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Carlin. You may step down. Um, you may be recalled. So uh, you would still be under the uh, an exclusion order where you may not discuss the case with any other witnesses and uh, or watch any coverage uh, of any witness's testimony, okay? I'll obey your wishes. Okay, thank you. All right, you. that's all. Is Mr. Carlin is free to go today. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've reached that point where we're going to let you go. Now, I just want to ask you, has anybody made plans based on my saying, I was going to do drug court tomorrow. And, okay, anybody? <coughs> so is there anybody who could not start at 8.30 with testimony? Okay, very well. Um, Judge, Judge Meltzer's... We just, can we approach on the side? Well, okay, sure. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so then uh, Judge Smeltzer's calendar opened up. He's able to cover that for me tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have you come in at 9 a.m. tomorrow, okay, for the beginning of testimony. We're going to try and get a number of things that we have to get sorted out, sorted out either tonight or tomorrow morning before you come back. But I think you've had enough uh, for one day, so uh, we're going to let you go. And again, uh, before you do, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, and I also just want to remind you, and it's very important, uh, that you not begin your deliberations and discussions about this case until all of the evidence has been presented. That includes amongst yourselves, as well as anybody else. Uh, and until you've been instructed on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio or television, internet, social media, any source whatsoever about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, websites, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. And again, I remind you that any information that you uh, receive outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, incomplete, and frankly downright inadmissible uh, as evidence. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on the jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. 
For example, do not communicate by blog, email, text message, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc., 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 on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you, and if anyone does so, despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home to discuss this with your family or loved ones. Again, friends, neighbors, there are probably all sorts of people that would love to talk to you about this case. Do not let anyone communicate with you about this case. Again, this case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. As I talked to you earlier today about what evidence actually is and what you must make your decision based upon. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone you want to, but you have to wait until the trial is over before you can discuss or talk about your experience as a juror. Again, these rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should also report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. So again, you are to decide this case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial, as I discussed earlier today. And I'm confident you will all follow that and remember to keep your duty as jurors uh, steadfastly in mind. All right, with that, we're gonna excuse you for the day. All rise. Okay, thank you. Please be seated if you wish. <clears throat> all right, um, wait till the door closes. Okay, council, uh, do you wanna take a break or do we need to take up anything else tonight? Uh, just the list of witnesses for tomorrow, and then my preference would be to take it up tomorrow between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. All right. Well, I, I do want to just go back to the motion uh, sidebar, 4.07 p.m., and it was related to the motion in limine. Mr. Nelson objected uh, to the examination of Mr. Carlin and getting into areas of Arguably, opinions, objection was sustained. Ms. Nodoff moved on after that. Anything further that either Ms. Nodoff or Mr. Nelson wish to put on the record with respect to that sidebar? No, Your Honor. Okay. And uh, I think uh, I think that covers it. Any other sidebars? Uh, you know, again, I mentioned the sidebar. We had... The, the last one, I think, was just about what time we're going to start tomorrow. I don't think we need to go into that. Agreed. All right. Uh, any other matters that uh, from this afternoon that either council would like to put on the record? Judge, just that tomorrow morning, I know we're going to try to meet to hash out some items. If we can go over evidence for Jason Stalker as well as exhibits for Jason Mingle. Um, so I, I believe we'll get to Mr. Mingle tomorrow. All right, well, there was the, again, the motion filed by the defense with respect to electronic communications. And that has, is that, we haven't addressed that entirely yet. <clears throat> again, I, we do have a pretrial ruling, and frankly, again, the court, uh, as long as the information is relevant and falls within the panorama decision the court had made. Um, court is likely to admit that evidence uh, again assuming it's relevant not uh, unfairly prejudicial and I'm not aware of what else may be out there other than what you know the court has received in terms of motions and so on so uh, is there anything in particular the court should look at any authority you would like the court to read tonight or particular motions the court should review before tomorrow rough idea of what the state is going to um, elicit, but I haven't actually seen it. I don't know. Mr. Hahn was going to see if he could get me copies of that today. I'm not sure he's had an opportunity to do so, however. Um, Judge, and I did, there was a request yesterday to provide, it was a request from Attorney Vishney to provide some 
additional detail about what information specifically as it relates to Instagram would come in through Mr. Mengel. And this morning, <clears throat> prior to getting started, um, probably prior to anybody being at the courthouse, I did email Attorney Vishni a, a much pared down version of what was provided as discovery. Um, I don't have, the printouts are in our prep room so I can certainly meet with Attorney Vishni after court today if she's available to, to look at some of those documents, but she does have uh, specific page numbers that I've in, in, at least indicated I may introduce. Um, I'm pretty confident we can work around any issues within those. The, the court referenced the messages as it relates to electronic messages between the defendant and, and John Hansen. Um, I don't think we need to address those in their entirety, but there are some messages that were pulled from Jason Mengel's cell phone extraction because he learned of the relationship between the defendant and John Hansen by viewing those messages on the defendant's cell phone and then taking a screenshot of those messages. It's not the more, I guess, inflammatory or racy photos that I think were probably the biggest reason for the objection which contained nude photographs of the defendant and some language outside of what's used in the messages contained on Mr. Mengel's uh, cell phone extraction. So I don't know if Attorney Vishni has had a chance to look at which photos those are. Um, I'm guessing there may not be an objection to those specific ones, but the purpose they'd be introduced would be to show those are the messages Jason Mengel saw and that's how he was made aware of the relationship which the court has already found to be relevant, the nature of the relationship between John Hansen, the defendant, uh, the way that Jason Mengel found out, and then the report to law enforcement uh, and the circumstances of that. So um, I think maybe it makes sense for Attorney Vishney and I to sit down and just pull certain ones that there are objections to, if there are any, and bring those to the court rather than addressing them in a, in a more blanket way, um, because I think a lot of them will be agreed to. All right. I agree, Excuse it me? makes sense okay. for us to look at the specifics. Is that okay for us to go over there? Yeah. All right. Good, well, it <laughs> just depends on what the other list of witnesses are. So I know right now Stalker and Mangle, is there? I think uh, Investigator Stalker would be the first witness tomorrow. <laughs> Probably Officer Mark Vang, followed by, this is... The likely order, Julia Post, then Jason Mengel. Um, assuming we get further, Matthew Schreiner. Uh, possibly Alex Zink. That might be near the end of the day. Uh, if we get further than that, it would probably be Jenna. Jenna I'm sorry, Jenna Van de Zand. Detective Proc will not testify tomorrow. Um, and as it relates to Jason. Information, electronic media that you intend to introduce from Mr. Stalker related to Ms. McCandless's numerous accounts. So let me tell the answer. Yeah, no. The, Just the journals. Okay. And I believe we have a working agreement regarding the journals. We'll have a redacted copy of the journals that I believe is a final, almost finalized, and um, the parties both agree to them, so that shouldn't be an issue before Investigator Stalker. Nothing else, Judge. Okay, very well then. 